Okay, welcome to part two. Um, so we we were just up to the stop, uh, the go and no go tasks. Um, so uh, Blake Moore and Robbins. Um, this is a nice little background study. Um, this essentially used very very similar, if not uh, almost identical, procedural techniques to Casey et al. Okay, and and so what they did was they put teenagers in a brain scanner, in an fMRI scanner. And they said, right, go, no, go. Go, so click when the face isn't smiling, and don't click when the face is smiling. Now, if you think about those cookies, the alluring stimuli is uh, somebody smiling at you compared to no smile. Okay, we want to respond to somebody who's smiling at us. Okay, they are friendly. They could be a potential mate. They could be someone who can help us get on in the world. Uh, they are potential friends. Okay, so they tested teenagers on their ability to not click go when they saw the uh, smiling face. This is known as a hot task because um, in a f affective hot contexts which means yeah those situations where you are tempted by something and what they found was uh, this is the number of errors now you can see the number of errors so when teenagers uh, click when they shouldn't when that face appears they click away they go oh no I shouldn't have clicked then um, teenagers make far more errors than adults and children and on the uh, on the fMRI scanner this area of the ventral striatum so this is a view from the back of the brain that central area of the brain seems to be uh, much more active in these decisions and you can see in the final graph with the teenagers um, the signal change which means this area of the brain how much more activation was there um, in comparison to the go trials well there was much more uh, activation in the teenagers ventral striatums um, when these smiley faces appeared okay so this reward part of the brain uh, teenagers were going oh a, a smiley person and we're really excited by that in their ventral striatum whereas the children and the adults um, from the straight faces their perhaps their frontal lobes were, were probably their frontal gyruses were more active they weren't as excited as you can see so lots more activation there and that's a, a nice study that, that is extremely similar to the Casey study of, of their terminology, which you'll see in a sec. Okay, pause me and go over what we've done so far. Make lots of notes and digest it. Okay, there's still plenty to come. And, um, yeah, it's important that you, you uh, summarize that. Okay. Right, if you've uh, paused me and pressed play again, we should carry on. So we're on to the background, the study background. Um here we go growing up um, so cookie to smiling face and that's what we're talking about with the study background IGST 2006 performance on a delay of gratification task in childhood predicted the efficiency with which the same individuals performed a cognitive control task as adolescents or young adults in other words IGST showed that uh, the young kids with the marshmallow task um, if they were what's called a, a low delayer there, okay, low delayer meaning they could not delay, they could not stop themselves, they couldn't delay gratification. Those individuals who were like that with the marshmallow were also on a stop, on a, on a, on a go, no go task, were also uh, problematic. They also couldn't perform very well on a cognitive control task. Okay, so this was this first time that quite an important connection is being made between what a child is like in terms of their impulsivity and what a young person is like, an adolescent is like. Okay, There's no brain scans involved with this and that's going to be the difference between the XT study and, and the, the Casey study. But there you go, on that simple go, no go task, lots more errors were made by those who also made errors as children. 
the high temptation focus group had more difficulty suppressing inappropriate actions. Okay, and that's what we're talking about. And the findings suggest that performance in preschool delay of gratification may predict the capacity in adulthood to control thoughts and actions. This is quite a big statement again that's being made think about the ethical considerations for potentially for society some people in society might say hey if we can predict those individuals at a very early age who are going to be not be able to control their emotions as adults then what should we do with them okay there are going to be people who will make that call so this is this isn't a simple you know the no consequence study this it's quite big claims being made here likewise alluring or social context can diminish self-control so hair has done lots of research into things like psychopaths and um, impulsivity and all that kind of stuff and so he makes the observation that the context that you find yourself in if you've got some friends that are um, what your parents would describe as part of the bad crowd then you're gonna make you're gonna become um, there's going to be more alluring situations that are available to you. All right. So, um, if this impulsive kid grows up with nice friends who never get into trouble or come across drugs or alcohol, then you'll be all right. But Hare's research with Eggsty's research might suggest, oh, watch out. If you've got a kid who can't control themselves with a cookie jar when they're little, then they might get into trouble if they're in with the wrong crowd when they are older, okay? Because social contexts can diminish our self-control, okay? So the aim of KC then, uh, as a result of all that, um, was to build on that previous research to assess whether delay of gratification, putting, putting off that gratification in childhood, predicts impulse control abilities so your ability to control your impulses and sensitivity to alluring or social cues, in this case they used happy faces, at the behavioural and neural level, right? Behavioural means stopping yourself from pressing the button in the go-no-go -go task, that's behavioural, you can see the behaviour, and the neural level is in a brain scan. But when participants are in their 40s, so we're going beyond adolescence here, we're comparing them, as a child, as a teenager, and then as an adult, as a 40-year-old adult, okay, or 40-plus-year-old adult, okay? So, they're going to use an fMRI scanner just to explain what that is. Uh, an MRI scanner on its own is just a picture, whereas an fMRI scanner is more like a video. It shows uh, activation happening in real time, and you can put a, a screen in there, and um, you can ask participants to do tasks when they're in there um, and you can see the resulting activation. The red areas are high levels of activation, um, the grey areas not much going on there. Okay, So yeah, it's a functional neuroimaging procedure. All right, Functional meaning moving functions and neuroimaging obviously the brain is neuro and imaging is the pictures okay detects the different blood flow in the brain the when you're using an area of your brain more there's more blood flow that goes into that area and that's how you can tell what's going on okay right pause me again and uh, summarize that uh, background and the aim so moving on the study details, the research method, let's have a look. Right, this is can be regarded as a quasi or a natural experiment. Um, quasi experiment because the IV was, the independent variable is whether the participant was a high or a low delayer in childhood, okay, with that cookie task. Um, and that was naturally occurring because whether they'd done it or not when they were little was down to their decision and so could not be manipulated or controlled by the researchers. So the researchers are taking these high and low delayers from childhood and seeing whether that predicts their ability to do badly on a go no go task and whether it predicts whether their brain scan is going to show a difference between these two groups, those who um, couldn't delay and those who could delay who are much more Yoda like. 
The dependent variable was the performance on the impulse control task, as I've mentioned, so the reaction times and the accuracy, all right, whether they pressed go or no go, uh, didn't press go, sorry, for the no go task, whether they were accurate in that, and how quickly they could do it. Okay, in experiment one, and the same was measured in experiment two, but they added the image in results, so they were asked to do it in an fMRI brain scanner. Okay, so in experiment two, you just add in the brain scans as well. So, um, there was a piece of research between when they were little and when they were in their forties, in their twenties and thirties, and. Um, they were able. They, they, uh, the participants were asked to do self-control scales, just a simple self-report in their twenties and thirties. Um, and those participating in experiment one did both the hot and cold go no go tasks. Means the study had in parts a repeated measure design, so we can say it's repeated measures in a way because they're doing go and no go tasks. But on the other hand, it's independent measures because they're classed as these uh, low or high delayers as well. Okay, but they're all doing both sets of tasks um, in terms of the hot and cool, which you'll see what hot and cool tasks mean in a sec. It's also a longitudinal study. If you think about it, it's, it's you know, since when they were little, up from when they were four until when they were 40. So there's a longitudinal element to this study. Um, where were they from? They were from Stanford's Bing um, Nursery School. Those of you who've been to San Francisco or want to go, that's San Francisco. That's the Golden Great Bridge just there. And this is down in Palo Alto. You've got Stanford University. And uh, the nursery is the essentially a lot of the university students with kids. And the, pair, uh, the lecturers and the staff uh, will put their kids into this nursery school. So that's where the sample's coming from. 562 four-year-olds were used from Bing University um, and they were doing that com the delay gratification task in the late 1960s and early 70s. So they were being tested around that time. 155 of them completed, so out of those 562, 155 did the self-reports, the self-control scales, when uh, in 1993, uh, in their 20s. And then 135 of those did it when they were in their 30s in 2003 okay so they're doing two lots of scales there but not all of them some of them are dropping out subject attrition is that what that's known as for longitudinal research 117 of those 135 that were left uh, were, who were above average so the high delayers okay so we were very good at delaying and those who were below average very low delayers uh, in their original so when they were four years old as well as the self-report measures uh, were contacted so they wanted those ones at the both end of the scale the really uh, high delay performances and the low delay performances so we got 59 uh, 23 males 36 females of the 117 so they didn't all agree to take part but most did in experiment one there were 32 high delayers and 27 low delayers and then 27 of those 59 who had participated in experiment one agreed to take part in the brain scan of experiment two so not all of them did could have been because of time could have been because they didn't want the brain scanning but not all of them took part and in experiment two there were 15 high delayers and 11 low delays so a much smaller sample um, but there you go the high delays remember are the Yoda types the low delayers are the cookie monster types Okay, right, join me in part three for the next bit. Just uh, summarize the sample.